Welcome everybody to today's webinar. We're gonna get started here. We're gonna start with a little bit of housekeeping. My name is Larkin McGowan. I am a senior supervisor here in the marketing department and will be helping out with uh, the logistics here and a little bit of color commentary. So let's go through the housekeeping items. You can go through um, this panel here and utilize it to maximize or minimize your webinar pane. We also encourage you to ask questions and you will see a questions box here in your pane. We will allow those questions to collect through the webinar and then address those at the end of the webinar. You can also modify your audio settings. If you are using a phone, please make sure you are on the phone setting. And if you're on your computer, please make sure you are on your computer setting. We also need to go through some CPE qualifications. If you are needing to qualify for CPE, make sure you're on your personal computer. You cannot use a smartphone. You also need to be logged in with a unique URL that was provided to, to you when you registered. You also need to be logged in for 50 consecutive minutes. That's very important and actively respond to the polling questions. You need to respond to three of the four polling questions within this webinar. And at the end, a survey will actually pop up for you and you need to take that survey right away in order to get your CPE credits. All right, moving on to the webinar. So we will open up with addressing cyber security landscape. We will discuss privacy surrounding data privacy and CCPA. And we will consider some of these next steps and how you can protect your business, both surrounding data privacy and cyber. One of the things I do want to mention today that is a bit unique is everybody on this call is a Armanino client or Armanino staff member. And the reason we did this, this is we've seen a significant move in cybersecurity and data privacy. We've seen the needs in the business landscape grow uh, as we are seeing technology evolve, we are seeing legislation gain momentum. And so we wanted to be able to put this on for you specifically for our client audience. So today we will have, hear from Liam Collins, our partner and practice leader of the RAS Group. He will introduce himself and then we will go on to Pippa and Terry who are our two presenters today. So here you go, Liam, take it away. Thank you, Larkin, and good morning, everybody. Um, I am Liam Collins. I'm the partner that's in charge of risk assurance here at Armanino. Uh, the risk assurance practice covers a number of different areas, including cybersecurity and data privacy. And thank you again for joining. You know, as Larkin says, this is just for our clients as a value add for you, really trying to communicate what we're seeing in the marketplace with respect to cyber. Uh, the number of breaches and hacks is, is growing exponentially and no longer are just large companies at danger. It's small and mid-sized companies that are really feeling the effect of this. Um, I think we have some perspective for you this morning around what we're seeing and also what you can do about it. And in addition to that, with changing regulatory landscape around data privacy, giving you an update on the new California Consumer Privacy Act and what we're seeing also across other states with respect to some changes in the environment that I think would be of interest to you. So today with me, I have Pippa Akem and Terry who will do introductions and then get started with the webinar. And again, thank you very much for joining. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pippa Rakem. I'm a senior in the RAS practice, focusing exclusively on privacy. Um, I have um, existed in the regulatory compliance space for some time, um, serving as the compliance officer for the city of Dallas, and then um, transitioning into the privacy space um, as part of the global team, privacy team at Microsoft that led GDPR implementation, and uh, most recently um, also um, worked with CBSI, helping with the transition to CCPA compliance. And um, with that said, I will introduce you to Terry. Thank you so much, Pippa. Hi, this is Terry O'Daniel. I'm a director in the cybersecurity practice for RAS. Um, I've been with Armanino for about six months, and uh, my own background is in IT security operations and uh, running network engineering for a variety of startup companies. I also helped several large banks and high-tech companies uh, work their way through the first few years of Sarbanes-Oxley once it passed as a law. 
And I've spent the last 10 years working in the governance, risk, and compliance space for technology, uh, helping Yahoo build its uh, governance, risk, and compliance function out, and uh, implementing the first SOX compliant CI CD pipeline at Yahoo, as well as uh, running technology compliance at Salesforce for three years, focusing on risk, internal monitoring, and uh, use of automation to drive down the cost of compliance and the cost of auditing. Here at Armanino, I'm helping um, bring the cybersecurity practice to the fore, uh, focusing a little more in some of the emerging threats that we're facing in the cyber practice, which is a good way, segue to get started. The world is changing, and nowhere is that more clear than in the space of cybersecurity. On top of that, the rate of change is accelerating. We see that in the cybersecurity space, for many years, it's been the case that companies could take an approach where they simply considered themselves too small to be a target for cyber attacks. As we all know, automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence have been increasing within the sphere of technology. But that also facilitates the ability of hackers to breach networks cheaper, faster, and easier than ever before. With that automation, people who may not have a deep background in technology can still exploit scripts against robust networks with a reasonable degree of success. Once again, we're seeing this has always been a concern for larger companies, but now in the small and mid-sized business space, it's becoming an increasing concern. Looking back over 2018, we see that almost half, 43%, of all confirmed data breaches that were listed in the Verizon Data Breach Incident Report hit small and medium businesses. Again, if you think your company is too small to be a target of hackers, keep in mind, hackers aren't humans necessarily anymore. The first time a hacker touches your network, it's more likely to be via a botnet, scripting, or some sort of automation. Being able to deploy that automation at scale gives hackers a much broader reach and thus, we're seeing a dramatic increase in the amount of small and medium businesses hit by those data breaches. <laughs> Another area where we see a disturbing trend continuing is phishing. I think everyone's aware of phishing by now and hopefully of the dangers it, it, pauses, or it poses. But to be frank, a lot of us in the security space had hoped that by now phishing would become less of a concern. But phishing attacks continue, and not only do they continue, they continue to be deployed because they're cheap, and they're easy, and they work. Again, looking back over 2018, 92% of all data breaches involved malware, malware delivery via email. That's phishing. Of those attacks, having phishing somewhere in that attack chain gives the attackers the ability to put malware directly on those systems. From that point, the attack chain just becomes easier. The cost of deploying phishing training across your entire organization is probably relatively minimal compared to the risk of the data breach you face otherwise. So why are, why are hacks occurring? What is the motivation for hackers? There's a lot of concern about insiders, rogue insiders, hacktivists, state agents, et cetera. But we see in 2018 that the financial gain continued to be the number one motivator for data breaches. And it's a, a key reason why we see an increase in ransomware deployment. Ransomware takes out the middleman. In other words, hackers don't need to breach your network, steal your data, exfiltrate it, and find a buyer on the marketplace. They can simply use ransomware to get money directly from the target of an attack. The challenge with cybersecurity and these emerging threats is many of our clients struggle to find good cyber talent. Talent is expensive, it can be difficult to keep talent, and it can be difficult to know how much to invest in your cybersecurity organization for a, a company that's in the small SMB space. The challenge with not focusing on the human element, that is, the talent element of cybersecurity is, We've seen 
that simple errors, be they misconfiguring a firewall, uh, setting up your network storage incorrectly, or some, something as simple as putting the wrong email address in the to field of an important email. Simple errors accounted for 20%, 21% of data breaches in 2018. Again, the human element of cybersecurity continues to be dramatically important. Finally, we're seeing that we all hope that we have defense in depth and we have a series of controls. Some controls uh, act in a preventative way, like a firewall, they protect our network from hackers. And we also have detective controls or corrective controls where if uh, a hacker is able to infiltrate our network, at least we, relieve, we receive an alert. But the sad fact remains that in 2018, we see that more than half of breaches took over a calendar month to be discovered. Imagine how much harm a hacker or a team of hackers could do if they were in your network undetected for a month. That's, that's really interesting. This is Larkin. I'm going to chime in here because this was one of those statistics that perks my ears a little bit. Um, 56% of breaches took over a month to be discovered. That's actually a significantly higher percentage rate and business days that I would have expected, Terry. In your experience, because you have lived in this space for quite a while, what, what impact maybe per day uh, does this have? What should businesses be thinking about um, in almost bringing this number down? How, how can a company think about getting this to a three-day process? Yeah. Can you expand on that a little bit? That's a great question, Larkin, and, and we'll drill in a little deeper to some of the, the actual costs. It's always difficult to predict the cost of a yeah, breach, sure. but we have seen in, in a few cases where there have been actual breaches, and we can use that as data points to understand how much it might cost a certain a company in a certain industry of a certain size, how much it might cost them to respond to a breach. And we have a use case where we'll drill in deeply to a case where uh, a recent breach affected a medical collection company to the tune of $4 million. Hmm. And that actually hit the company so hard that they were forced to file for bankruptcy. Okay. So these threats are becoming, especially in the SMB space, existential threats to companies. Interesting, yeah, that, that's really interesting. So, okay, so we have a way then to help companies essentially assess the potential impact on their, com on Absolutely. their company. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that leads us into our first polling question. So just as a reminder, if you are looking for CPE credit, you need to participate in three of the four polling questions that will be happening throughout this webinar. So our first polling question, and this is going to test your paying attention skills here, what percent of small businesses, small to medium sized businesses experience data breaches? So question uh, A, option A is zero to 25%, B is 26 to 50%, C is 51 to 75%, D is 76 to 100%. We'll just give it, we've got good participation. We'll give it a couple more moments here. Okay, all right, we are closing the poll. So here we go, all right. So we've got a good chunk of people right there in that middle range. So we are close. So the, the statistic that Terry shared with us was 46% of small businesses and medium-sized businesses experience data breaches. Thank you so much par for participating. All right, so Terry, share with us a little bit more about the cyber landscape, breaches, trends, and give us a little bit, little bit more on that, please. Absolutely. So I'd like to talk through four examples of breaches and, and trends we're seeing, and these are all from 2019. Here is, uh, what, about two thirds of the way through, and we've seen several significant breaches thus far. Um, one of the most troubling ones that, that impacts a lot of, um, uh, citizens and uh, visitors to the U.S. is Customs and Border Patrol, or Customs, excuse me, Customs and Border Protection suffered a breach through a third-party contractor earlier this year that caused us to lose uh, 100,000 
pictures of license plates and pictures of travelers themselves. Now, again, this was a third party breach. That means uh, CBP had contracted with a, a third party uh, consultants, uh, Perceptics, uh, to implement this technology. The troubling thing is not only as a result of this breach uh, at Perceptics did we lose this 100,000 license plates and pictures of travelers, but we've also lost the implementation details, the security configurations and technology configurations for how Perceptics worked with the government to implement these details. So that, that information is now floating out there in the wild. There's going to be um, an indirect cost for CBP and other associated agencies to perhaps change their procedures, change their standards to ensure that those details um, that are out there aren't exploited. As we see the um, rapid push to deploy uh, facial recognition technology in airports for the speed of check-in, um, it makes one question, uh, how much are we really protecting uh, our personal data for, um, uh, especially, you know, citizens have a, a higher standard uh, for government agencies that there's a, a degree of due care of protection of that data as we roll out these um, uh, these technologies in the interest of, of speed and convenience, how are we balancing that against uh, the data loss and cyber uh, considerations? And Terry, I guess on one point on that one, I, that, that also I think reinforces the importance of good third party risk management. You know, lots of our clients are talking to us about they want to outsource many processes, right? And I know when they outsource, sometimes they'll feel like we're also getting rid of the responsibility and the, you know, the risk to us as a company, but it really doesn't. And the company that, or I guess the organization in this situation with US CBP, they're, they're the ones that get hit with the reputational impact. Absolutely. Okay. And you, you made a good point about outsourcing. You know, I, I, there's been a move to um, replace the word outsourcing with co-sourcing sometimes. And, um, I'll admit, I found it a little hokey at first as a phrase, but it really does drill in the fact that you cannot simply transfer a risk to a third party. You still own that risk. As you said, no one is going to think of this breach and think of perceptics. They're going to think of customs and border protection. Absolutely. There's many things that, you know, you as companies that you can do and think about when you're going to, you know, co-source or outsource with another party, right? Are you looking at their SOC 2 reports? What questionnaires are you sending to them around their security controls? What due diligence are you doing when you engage with anyone that you're going to do business with or that would have access to confidential information that you don't want to get out there? So I know that's an area we work with a lot of clients and helping them build up programs around vendor risk management. So again, a very important topic. That's great. Yes, and, and um, I think we'll, we'll see um, an explosion in this area probably as we explore supply chain, and supply chain will, will come up in just a minute as another attack vector. So I mentioned ransomware earlier. Um, to be frank, uh, many of us in the security industry really thought that ransomware would be trending downwards by now, but that is not the case. We are seeing uh, ransomware attacks continuing. Of course, everyone now is familiar with ransomware attacks at, at the end user or consumer level. Uh, small and mid-sized businesses, et cetera. And the reason those attacks are so common is ransomware exploits RDP, which is remote desktop protocol. What that does is it allows um, maybe an outsourced IT company or uh, a centralized office to install software on everyone's computer or laptops so that you can remotely help people troubleshoot their problems and things like that. The challenge is that technology also allows hackers to uh, install ransomware pretty directly on your system and thus it can encrypt the contents of your entire system, which is how uh, hackers will then uh, try to get money out of you. It's by simply saying your hard drive is encrypted. If you ever want to see that data again, pay me money. So that was bad enough to begin with, but now we're seeing an explosion of ransomware into municipalities, airports, even utilities. Um, it, just in the last two years, we've seen attacks successfully for ransomware against the Colorado Department of Transportation. Uh, I think it's it's pretty commonly known now about the, the ransomware incident in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, but we've also seen it in Albany, Tallahassee, Augusta, Baltimore. The Cleveland airport was a victim of ransomware. That's a bit scary. And finally, um, a recent ransomware incident was uh, one of the largest utilities in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, City Power was subject to a, a ransomware attack. And that, that points to the what we're seeing is the emerging piece of this, installation of ransomware on computer systems used to control manufacturing and heavy industrial automation. All it takes 
is changing the calibrations on those systems by microseconds and the cost to companies or the danger to human life can be catastrophic. So that's a trend we're seeing with ransomware and um, we're uh, struggling, I think, a little bit because ransomware is not a problem only in and of itself, but how it's used by state actors. Which leads to another trend we're seeing, supply chain attacks. What a supply chain attack is when your computer goes and connects to a legitimate uh, application or operating system update. I'm sure you know if you have uh, Windows installed on your computer, every so often it wants to go connect to the update servers, download some patches, and the same thing with maybe your uh, QuickBooks or other software like that. What we saw in uh, the past several years is state actors have been repurposing ransomware as an attack vector to install malware via recognized and legitimate uh, software updates. For example, there was a, during the cyber war between Russia and Ukraine, um, it is alleged that uh, Russia took over the uh, app update servers for an account, uh, you can, an accounting app, kind of like Quicken in Ukraine. And that resulted in any of those uh, companies that were using that application connecting to those servers and downloading what they thought was a legitimate update. In fact, what they were updating was malware. Now, it looked like ransomware, and it said, your hard drive's encrypted. If you want to see it back, pay here. The problem was it wasn't really ransomware. The data was never going to be unencrypted. It was simply an attack, and it was quite successful. So this is a case where we see uh, what seem like fairly innocuous tools. Maybe they're only affecting end users, SMBs, et cetera, but the, the potential for them to be repurposed and used for real danger is intense. So, so Terry, I'm curious, are there preventative actions that small and medium-sized businesses can take now? Is it a be proactive or is it a be reactive kind of landscape? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's certainly better to be proactive. And I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit uh, about some, some tactical things you can really do okay. to uh, mitigate some of these risks that we're facing in the cyberspace. But for supply chain attacks, it always pays to check and double check what vulnerabilities are out there currently. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing just what's happening in, in the cyberspace can save you some heartache. Yeah, makes sense. All right, let's talk about um, one last breach from 2019 that I, I referenced earlier. Um, the American Medical Collection Agency is a, a company that does uh, medical billing and collections for uh, many companies, but probably the, the most widely known one is for Quest Diagnostics. Um, they suffered a breach over that actually uh, over the course of eight months that uh, exposed 20 million patient records in the course of that breach. Now, the cost for both the recovery efforts, that is understanding the breach, trying to patch the holes, et cetera, just getting back to normal, as well as the cost to notify all of those patients uh, ran into the millions and, and it actually hit the cost of $4 million. And at that point, the company realized that um, they simply had to file for bankruptcy. So again, these, these breaches, these hacks, they may seem troubling, they may seem annoying, but we're finding that the costs are growing exponentially. They are existential threats for companies simply wanting to do business. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, another observation here is the title of the webinar was, you know, that it's no longer an option, right? Uh, no longer an option to kind of put our heads in the sand. And I'm personally aware um, and have had a couple of experiences in prior, prior companies where uh, I, I actually have a specific experience where a founder of mine said, oh, it won't happen to us. We have time. And, you know, the marketing and the sales department and the technology department were saying, oh, my gosh, there's regulations happening. There's technology happening. We've got to address this. But because uh, we were a startup, um, there was this feeling, number one, of we just don't have the resources to address this. And it feels overwhelming. Uh, number two, eh, again, human nature came into play. It's not going to happen to me. There's these huge stories out there. I don't have 20 million patient <laughs> records. Um, and, and also that, again, human tendency to think, oh, I have time. And 
it feels like the landscape is changing um, and it's why we titled this webinar the way that it is. It's like they're really, it really needs to be addressed. It's it's a serious issue that's coming coming up right now. And um, so, you know, it's it's something, again, we just can't put our heads in the sands. It is something we need to be considering. We're here to help everyone on this webinar consider things as well, um, just so you know. So let's go into the polling question here. Gives us a little bit of introspective, retrospective opportunity here with these questions. So we're gonna do two. Uh, two back to back. So first one, do you currently have preventative systems in place to prevent a breach? Yes, no, unknown. I have no idea. <laughs> It'd be nice to get high participation on this one. I think it'll be insightful for all of us. And a little bit as a benchmark for our listeners too here, we've got 104 people attending this webinar. So this is probably arguably statistically significant, <laughs> right? That's true. All right, about five more seconds. We're at 82%. Is there such thing as 100% participation? <laughs> All right. Great, thanks guys. Oh yes, we skyrocketed to 86, that's awesome. All right, let's close the poll. All right, well, encouraging statistics here. This is great to see 76% um, say yes, we have preventative systems in place, that is fantastic. We've got 6% at no and 18% at unknown. All right, let's go on to the next. So here we go. What is your level of confidence in your organization to respond quickly to a breach? So this is one of those things addressing that statistic we heard earlier about it taking, what was it, 30, 30 days, Terry? Yeah. Over 30 days a for a company to discover they have had a breach? Great, we're watching the polls here. We're at 75% participation. It'd be nice to get up to that high 80s since we do have a good group of people on this call. Great, about five more seconds. All right, closing the poll. Awesome. This is interesting in light of the first question. Um, I find it very interesting because I think we had we had quite a high response saying yes, we have preventative, preventative systems in place, uh, but confidence in those systems working is a whole other question, and um, and and that's okay. You know, we this is a new landscape. We are building systems. It's great that we have a really high answer to um, our clients saying, yes, we've got something in place. There's always ability to iterate, improve, and obviously keep up with the landscape here. So we've got a good group of people, very confident, a decent group of people here sitting in neutral and some low confidence there. So very interesting to see. All right, so we're gonna close up a little bit with Terry. Um, he's just gonna give us a couple of tips on keeping your cyber sanity. All right, Terry. Thanks, Larkin. Yeah, you know, it can be it can be overwhelming sometimes to hear um, these statistics, to hear some of the breaches. You might start to think, if these large companies with all these resources and devoted personnel can't keep um, their companies safe, if uh, if Target or Verizon can suffer breaches despite being compliant with many regulations, what can I do? Where can I start? What we recommend is taking a very pragmatic approach to cybersecurity. You can't boil the ocean overnight. So to stay sane, the most important thing is to simply understand your risks. If you're a small 10 person law office, you don't have the same risk profile or risk appetite as a large international bank. So risks are specific 
to your company in your industry at your size at your spot in the growth curve but understanding that takes individual attention to your uh your needs the the makeup of your executive leadership and the space that you're in one of the things if we have time later on i'd like to talk about is an emerging trend that is called risk quantification that's an ability that's the the hope that we can marry the way um the, the governance approach that a board would take to other operational considerations in the same way that you would look at cyber risk so that you can measure quantify and manage your investment for cyber risk again i hope larkin we'll have time for that but we'll see that'd be great so after you understand your risks start to look into the specific vulnerabilities that you're facing there are threats out there and there will always be threats out there but a threat is like a hurricane you can't do anything directly about a hurricane. What you need to understand is your specific vulnerabilities. Perhaps in the case of a hurricane, uh, at my house, I have very strong doors, but my windows aren't very solid. Maybe my neighbor has great windows, but his doors are not so solid. You need to understand how those threats interact with your systems, your people, your processes, and that's understanding your vulnerabilities. Buying solutions that are out there that are um, that promise to take care of all those threats, again, are not tailored to your risk appetite and your vulnerabilities. Once you've understood those vulnerabilities, it gives you the chance to make intelligent investments. We all have limited time and resources. Where are you going to invest that money for the best return so that you can maintain your cyber sanity, so that you can get sleep at night and know that the company will be there in the morning? That's where we try to help helping people understand the maturity and the capability of their existing controls so that we can help them understand where to spend money to bring other areas up to an acceptable level. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the people element has to maintain a focus. So much of cybersecurity is, um, uh, it appears to be very technical, uh, involving firewalls and, um, you know, things that, that may sound beyond the comprehension of, of most business leaders, but that's not truly the case. Most of cyber breaches come down to a human error at some point, either in misconfiguring one of those endpoints, misconfiguring uh, cloud storage, or simply not uh, simply being trained well enough to know not to click on a link in a suspicious email. Focus on the people, focus on the training, and you'll see great investments for cybersecurity. Finally, Measure your progress. Put a line in the sand and say, here's where we are today. We've looked at our risks with eyes open. We've looked at our maturity and capability of our controls. It's not great, but now we know what we have to do and where we're starting. With the advent of, of cyber insurance and other things like that, wouldn't it be helpful to be able to go back to your executive leadership or the board or even your insurance broker and say, here's data showing how our cyber program has improved over the past six months. Again, these are bite-sized, pragmatic steps that help you maintain your security while still keeping in mind the existential threat that cyber attacks can face against companies. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I think we'll now pass it over to Pippa Kim, who will talk a little bit about, as I've talked about the sort of hard candy shell of protecting a company, Pippa's going to take us inside that layer and talk about why the data inside is so valuable and worth protecting. Thanks, Terry, for um, such a wonderful presentation. Um, a lot is going on in the privacy space. And um, if you are a company um, and you have customers um, and you have business partners and um, you have vendors, um, you are likely in, in scope for a privacy regulation. So let's take a look at what's going on, what we're noticing in the privacy space. Um, more and more companies are relying on consumer data, customer information to drive innovation, um, to um, develop new services and new products. And um, there are risks associated with driving those innovations and, and those risks can, can be mitigated. Um, we also know that um, privacy is frequently in the news of late. Um, we have um, recently um, the breach, the data breach um, involving Capital One. 
And it's not only the big companies, there are also small companies. Um, we're beginning to see some traction in the EU, and um, I don't want to deviate too much into that, but um, we're beginning to see um, smaller businesses in the EU facing some hefty fines under GDPR. And um, it doesn't take long for one jurisdiction to mimic or copy um, the um, direction of a previous law or an existing privacy law. Um, what we're also seeing is that um, individuals want more control. They are very um, wary over how companies use their information. Um, you, if you're a customer, you go online, you make a purchase and you issue your payment information for that purchase. Um, you, you may question um, other ads that are targeting you at a later point. So obviously um, customers, um, individuals are very concerned. Um, there are some statistics though around um, the level of concern and, and why there is such turmoil if you are um, a business. Um, some statistics show that um, 54 of um, customers or consumers are concerned about the vulnerability of their um, data. Um, another statistic shows that 54% um, think companies don't have their best interest at heart in handling their personal information. Well, with the same, within the same survey, you had 84% wanting not to be treated as a number. So there is that paradox, that personalization paradox where customers are afraid to um, share their information, but um, still want those services that um, are personalized to their convenience. Um, we're also dealing with um, an increasing um, number of um, regulatory agencies wanting greater enforcement authority. Um, in this country, you have um, FTC um, battling um, recently, I'm sure many of us on this call or in this webinar um, have heard of the um, hefty um, fine imposed on Facebook. Um, it's no different in, in, in other jurisdictions as well. So the next slide gives you um, an idea of where we are headed in terms of uh, privacy regulation. There is a global push um, and, and laws have some reoccurring themes. Um, essentially, privacy laws are aiming to reform the relationship um, between the business and the customer, the consumer. Um, we also see that um, laws want to um, give greater control over um, the personal information, the private information to the uh, customer or consumer. Um, we're also seeing um, sanctions if you fail to um, follow the compliance requirements, um, heavy sanctions being levied. And um, I believe roughly two months ago, there were a series of heavy sanctions that were levied against companies that we're all very familiar with, including British Airways. So um, essentially, um, keep in mind that um, laws are it, I mean, there is a wave of regulations and, and um, if you are a company that um, has access to information um, protected by those laws, you need to take notice and um, make sure you have systems in place to address those laws. Um, one thing we're also um, noticing uh, is the reoccurring thing with um, consumer rights, rights that are granted by um, those regulations, privacy regulations, um, you have, um, and this time to um, establish privacy uh, principles, principles that um, should be common sense if you are handling information. Um, for instance, um, the right to be informed um, ties into the transparency and fairness requirement. If you are collecting personal information, you need to tell those whose information you are gathering, um, what you are doing with that information, why you are collecting that information. And you need to be precise in your description and use of that information. You also need to give them um, rights to access the information whenever they will. Um, you have to also provide um, rights for them to correct um, access to um, correct 
any inaccuracies, data inaccuracies, that deals with um, the right of rectification. And in any case, if, uh, if they wish to not deal with your business or move on to the next business, um, you need to provide the mechanism for them to be able to um, delete or transport their information and to opt out, um, we're seeing this with CCPA and GDPR, you, they need to be able to opt out of um, any sale of their information or to object to um, further processing. Um, the key thing that um, you, you really should take away from this slide, other things are of course very important, um, but the right of private action, um, Come, essentially, if an individual, a consumer, suffers a loss, um, they could potentially sue the company. And think of class action lawsuits if there are multiple um, victims of a data breach and um, what that could mean for the bottom line. Can I call, can I call one thing out, Pippa? Would you yes. go back to the slide that shows the global point of view? Yes. One of the things I do just want to mention here is it can be overwhelming. There is a lot of regulatory and legislative things happening. There's amendments coming down the pipe and all these things. And I do just want to say that, you know, Armanino has been very intentional to hire people that are um, experts in this field like Pippa and Terry. And so if, if I'm thinking as a client, oh my gosh, how am I going to keep up on these constantly moving and these changes, GDPR hit, CCPA is coming down the pipe. There's all of these things that will eventually, whether they're starting in Europe and coming, coming to the US, whether they're starting in the US and moving out, um, if I'm an international company, you know, whatever it is, I need somebody to be essentially watching my back and really have the knowledge here. And so I just wanted to kind of say that out loud that there really is a commitment here for our clients um, here at Armanino that we are staying on the very forefront of regulatory movements, technology movements, and things like that. Yeah, absolutely, Larkin. I think this is, um, you know, this is a challenge in cybersecurity, as I mentioned earlier, but it, I would say it's even worse to some degree in data privacy because data privacy is an even newer discipline. Yeah. And with the advent of GDPR, CCPA, um, there's a lot of work to be done. And again, um, there's just not that much talent out there. That's one of the ways we, we try to help our SMB clients is to make sure that they have options. And, and people will talk through some of these later to um, use our expertise to help them manage their data privacy needs. Yeah, absolutely. So just calling it out, Pippa is a phenomenal resource to you guys. Thank you. Um, we're definitely here to help. So um, it, it, it is overwhelming, as um, Larkin and Terry have mentioned, and, um, and there are many moving parts. So how do you walk through all the moving parts? Um, it's, it's very critical to understand what those moving parts are. Um, and part of the understanding um, relies on what you know about the regulation. Um, for instance, with the CCPA, um, you are looking at a reg regulation that is very broad, that very broadly defines um, personal information um, and very broadly defines who a consumer is. And so in order to understand what you need to do so far as a compliance roadmap, um, the, the beginning point is understanding the requirements. What does the law say? And then you also need to look at um, the information in your ecosystem, your um, data ecosystem. Um, what type of information are you collecting? Um, the categories of information, the specific um, data types um, that you have in your repository. Um, what are the sources of that information? Who owns those information? Who has access to that information? And um, always have um, a purpose. Um, you don't, um, I mean, it used to be um, old practice that you could collect as much information as you needed, both structured and unstructured uh, data. Um, well, the law is changing, the regulatory landscape is changing and requiring you now to have a reason for um, processing information. Um, you also need to understand, for you to develop effective policies and to be um, to be able to monitor um, the effectiveness of controls, you need to have 
specific policies in place. Um, one of those being data um, classification policy, which basically limits access to your most confidential and uh, most um, sensitive data and uh, limits access by not only um, individuals within your company, your vendors, your employees who should have only a need to know access, but also to how and with whom you share that information. Um, you also need policies that um, define um, specific categories of consumers, for instance, children. Um, children's data is a big issue under both um, GDPR and CCPA. Um, there is um, an age gating requirement. So under um, CCPA, um, a minor um, child under 16 would require um, parental consent for you to um, sell their data, um, will require parental consent for certain disclosures to be made. And um, having a structured path um, helps you to prioritize your risk. This is all part of figuring it out. Um, you cannot know what risk you have without going through a process of analyzing your processing activities and understanding the exposure and then prioritizing which risks need to be resolved immediately. We can help with that if you don't have the bandwidth um, for doing that. Um, this is definitely um, not a time um, for companies to um, sit on the sideline. Um, you need to get going with your um, senior leadership, with your stakeholders to have that buy-in and um, to be able to communicate the essentials around the law. So just um, covering enforcement actions, um, these are some of the companies that um, recently um, face very hefty fine as a result of um, data breaches. So the key, the, the key takeaway from this slide is don't say it can happen to your company. It can indeed happen to your company. No company is immune from privacy breaches. So looking at some best practices, um, best practices acro um, apply across the board when it comes to your processing of personal information. Um, starting with only gathering information that you need. Um, this is part of, under GDPR, this is the data minimization requirement and CCPA uh, forces that issue by um, forcing companies to disclose what categories of information they are collecting and the specific information they are collecting and why. Um, a second thing, a second point is not to retain data longer than is necessary. Um, seek both automation and manual processes to enforce your retention policy. Not to forget to make sure that you have updated retention policies. Encrypt data, um, your very um, sensitive information, Encrypt that while at rest or in transit um, and limiting, again, access to very sensitive data. Um, back up your information very often um, for business continuity purposes in case there is ever a natural disaster. Um, use the least privilege um, rule for granting access to your personal data store and keep track of your inventory. Know the data in your data landscape. And these are great. Uh, these are great tactical considerations, Pippa. A lot of these also serve dual duty on the cyberspace as well. Backing up your data uh, really takes the um, the pain out of a ransomware attack. If you have that data, you can simply say, "Okay, well, you, you encrypted this computer, but I have that data backed up." So these are these are important both on the external area and internally protecting your data. Thanks, sir. So just um, a quick review of CCPA must know. Um, CCPA is the new regulation that is shaking up um, the privacy landscape. Um, it's a California law that has um, global reach, just as is with GDPR. Um, it's often referred to as GDPR um, light. Um, it has, um, it contains a very broad definition of personal information. Don't be um, misled by the description of um, the individual as a consumer. 
consumers are not just individuals that have some sort of direct relationship um, with the business. It can include employees. Um, it can include your business partners. It can include just about anyone um, that you collect their personal information. And it covers both households and devices as well. Um, wanting to draw attention to the principal rights um, that this law commands, um, you have the right to um, access personal information, any type of information a business has, um, a um, consumer can request access to that. A consumer can also request access to opt out of the sale of their personal information to third parties. Um, they can also request to delete um, um, some information within your um, um, data ecosystem. Of course, there are exceptions around um, information um, that supports your providing services to the consumer, um, information that pertains to law enforcement activities, and um, information that is controlled by other local, state, and federal law. Um, lastly, um, right to equal services. Um, this is particularly keen um, because um, businesses may choose to limit the type of information a customer has as a result of their exercise of their um, um, rights, consumer rights. Well, this law prevents that. Um, I spoke earlier to um, the age requirements around uh, minor data. Um, keep in mind that um, the penalty for violations of this law can um, um, range up to um, $7,500, and this is per incident. Uh, it, it can easily add up if you have um, multiple um, victims. Um, the law is enforced by the um, State Attorney General, and um, it's expected to take effect um, January 1 of 2020. Who is in scope for this law? There are three thresholds. Um, you have your um, gross revenue threshold, um, you would need to have um, annual revenues in excess of 25 million. Um, you also would need to um, annually buy, sell, or share personal information of 50,000 or more consumer um, data, households, devices. Uh, it, it's not too difficult to um, come across these numbers, to easily um, attain these numbers. Um, you also have a sales threshold whereby if um, you, your gross annual revenue is 50% of, comes from selling um, personal information, 50% or more comes from selling personal information, that would put you into scope. So you need not meet all three thresholds to um, have this law apply to you. One or more is sufficient. And again, you have to be for profit um, organization, doesn't apply to non-for-profit. Okay, that's interesting. And so I heard you say two things. They're calling it GDPR light. Yes. So that's kind of its nickname that's on the... <laughs> Absolutely, it's been given many names. Oh, that's that awesome. Name yeah, that's really interesting. And then I also heard you say it's not too hard to get to 50,000 records. Um, can you expand on that more? Is that because it includes employees, it includes customers, includes like, so it's... Well, the assumption is that um, most um, um, companies on this call have um, a web presence. Mm. So you have several individuals visiting your website and I am presuming you have cookies on your website, either proprietary cookies or third-party cookies gathering information. So any visitor to your website is potentially um, your customer. Oh wow! And 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 this is why it's so it's such an expansive law. You cannot say, well, even if I'm not consumer facing, it doesn't mm -hmm. apply to me. It it can um, with that broad definition. And the numbers are, are such low thresholds for a reason. Um, we don't want the legislature. I say we, but the legislature um, doesn't want exceptions based on company um, sizes, because um, there are so many vendor relationships and um, vendors do carry volumes, large volumes of personal or private data. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, maybe it would be good just to throw, flash this up here. This, yep. this will show you some of those areas. You can see, if you think about some of these areas with the personal information being collected, remarkably easy to hit 50K records very quickly. 
Absolutely. And um, this slide um, points to um, divisions within your company um, that are in scope for the CCPA, that are collecting um, personal um, information. And you need to know why they are collecting this information, um, where it's being stored, who has access to this information, and to make sure that your systems are um, engineered to respond to um, data subject access request. Great, so we're gonna go into a polling question. We've got five more minutes in the webinar. We're gonna do this polling question. Pippa's got just a couple more slides, um, just a couple on what's coming down the pipe. And um, we do have one question here. Maybe Terry, at the end, you could answer it, though I know it'd be nice if we heard the voices of the attendees too, but there is a question from Michael that, uh, asks about for those of you doing preventative systems to prevent breaches what systems are you using so maybe at the very mm. end terry you could list off a couple if they're on your mind i am unsure if our participants can throw in the chat um, or maybe throw in the questions your answer if you want to participate in that but let's go in let's close this up here um, and give pippa her time to close us up last polling question please participate quickly on this one which of the following is not a CCPA threshold that would cause an organization to be subject to CCPA compliance. This is very college question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she listed three thresholds. Uh, there's one of one in here is not the same. One of them is not a threshold. Pippa also mentioned that you only have to meet one of the thresholds. So that's a very good thing to remember. All right, go ahead and close the poll. Thank you so much for everyone participating. And we've got pretty smart people in the room. B is the answer. So collecting 50,000 okay. records of de-identified personal data is not one of the thresholds for CCPA. Absolutely. All right. The go identified ahead. information isn't um, a data scope for the CCPA. So just to close um, the presentation on privacy, um, some planning tips, some um, very effective um, compliance planning tips. Um, firstly, you need to understand the law, you need to track changes um, to the CCPA, and um, we have listed um, the series of legislation that um, will likely if signed into law sometime in October, will change um, the effect of the CCPA. So please keep track of that. Food for thought. Um, when it comes to um, compliance systems, um, try as much to avoid retrofitting old systems. Old systems were um, designed with very generic features. And we live in a very dynamic world and we live with very dynamic technology. And so trying to retrofit old systems may not be the best solution. And then lastly, um, having a compliance roadmap, um, you need to embrace compliance. Um, you need to embrace privacy as the new era. This is the new era where you have to have an accountable um, privacy management framework and structure to drive your business goals. And um, Lastly, to sum up um, the presentation, um, know that um, PI, um, sorry, personal information is a business asset. And mm -hmm. just as with any business asset, you need to manage it and be responsible for it. Great. Thank you. Pippa, thank you so much. Uh, that was a whole lot of very important and good information. Um, real quick here, so we've got that one question. Terry, do you have any thoughts on systems? Sure, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, drill too deeply into um, brand names, but I think the most important piece is to have defense in depth. Um, if you're starting out looking at your security posture from a compliance consideration, which frankly is where a lot of people start, we need to get PCI compliant, we need to get ISO compliant to make a certain sale, what have you. That's sort of the baseline at which you start. The problem is that um, that will trend towards detective controls because auditors love detective controls. So when we're talking about preventative controls, sure, we're talking about firewalls, but we're also talking about a lot of those attack vectors that I mentioned earlier. Phishing is incredibly prevalent and it keeps working. So let's focus <laughs> on phishing training. Let's focus on managed services, some of which we offer that can give you the ability to track um, every employee, when have they gone through phishing training? How effective has it been, et cetera? 
and um, anti-malware on every single endpoint. Every laptop needs anti-malware software installed because, again, that's an incredibly easy attack vector. If you can catch it at the source and prevent it from becoming an issue, then you still need detective controls. But again, having that, that first line of defense on every endpoint is really powerful. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for attending. And um, please know that Pippa, Terry, Liam, the Armenino RAS group is available. Um, we want to be a resource for you. You can connect with any of us on LinkedIn, be able to kind of watch the latest and greatest news, all that good stuff. But please know that we really value our relationships here at Armenino and we are available just as a resource. Even, even if it's that simple conversation of, I don't know where to start, can we just chat for a moment? Uh, we're available to you. Thank you for attending today. Within 48 hours, you're going to get a link to download the slide deck and the recording. Make sure you take the survey when you close. All right, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.